What's up, all my real gangsters? Where my philosophy and theology YouTube at? Um, Metal Theologian, congratulations on being first. 500 Nathan Nichols for you. Pine Cone, that was my YouTube name for a while. Uh, welcome. You get 250 Nathan Nichols. I apologize for the background noise, but my servant is being very rowdy uh, behind me. Uh, v? She didn't hear a thing. Uh, spin falter. V? Yeah. Less noise, please. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and spin falter in third 100 nathan nichols congratulations all who have made it um i'm gonna review a short and welcome everyone else but unfortunately if you weren't in the first three you're not good enough um yeah i'm gonna review a capturing christianity video that he did on how to share your faith i've seen a few little bits of it so without further ado let me just share the tab for you And this is very cathartic to me to um, just moan about Cameron. You know, it's it's easy, it's low hanging fruit. I don't have to think about it, and I can just have a laugh and feel good about myself because I am a hollow husk of a human being. Um, but looking at someone with even less human inside of them, <laughs> it's the time I'm talking to a camera. It's weird. Anyways. Uh, thank you guys for being here tonight. This is going to be really fun. So this is a talk I've given a, a few times. So that's me, Cameron Bertuzzi, guest speaker. And I'm talking to you today. The message is how to share your faith with Scott. Well, look at the t-shirt, the natural theology with the names of the arguments around it. If you're out anywhere and you see someone wearing a t-shirt like this, do not ask second questions, just run run <laughs> skeptics and i'm going to start with a story skeptics i i also find it funny how um the the idea is that anyone who disagrees with the um either the conclusion of these arguments from natural theology or whatever um proposition to do with christianity someone's trying to establish is automatically a skeptic right like these skeptics I mean, how many people who disagree even identify as skeptics? I mean, I know some do, right? Like people like Michael Shermer claim to be skeptics or whatever, but. You can go ahead and put up the picture. There it is. That is That's me in the thing. middle. So apologies for uh, showing you such an old picture. But this is like, I think this is the only picture I have of the three main characters in the story. The three main characters are Craig, guy on the left. He's my brother-in-law, me and my brother all the way on the right there. And basically, this is a story of how my brother became an atheist. And that's what sent me on a journey to look into apologetics and really just... So it wasn't, you know, how Cameron became a Christian in the first place. It had nothing to do with him believing any of this. He found that... So all of the reasons that he's going to provide people with are essentially post hoc, right, to the conclusion. So something about that seems kind of bad faith to me. If then the purpose of presenting these arguments is going to be to rationally compel people to believe revision in favor of the conclusion. Um, Discover whether or not Christianity... But I mean, this is a point that's been made, done to death. It's true. When he first... I, so the way that I found out about this, about my brother becoming an atheist, was through Craig. Craig gave me a phone call and he said, hey, look, pretty serious thing. Your brother, Trevor, he's going to be... He's like an atheist or he's becoming an atheist. He's really close. You need to talk to him. Serious. And I was like, this is... It's not that serious, okay? Because I've gone through like my own period of doubt. I was in Bible school at one point in my life, right after high school. And I was like, I worked through my doubts pretty quickly. I was like, this is gonna be easy. Like, I'll just go talk to him. So I called him up. And, you know, just think of that when the defense is down and he's sort of painting the picture of this story, you know, you get the the narrative framing of how he thinks about these things. Like, I worked through my doubts pretty quickly. So Cameron's like, he thinks now, firstly, at the position that he's at, that there aren't fundamental problems with his beliefs, that, or that a future version of himself won't look back on the beliefs that he has um, with some serious questions about 
why he believed those things or the kind of like justification for them or whatever um, and find them very dubious, right? But then the other um, idea here is that there's a kind of telos to doubting, right? And the telos is coming through and having this version of Christianity <laughs> where you just randomly, where not randomly, but where, you know, where you hold, hold to like five arguments from natural theology, cling to them like you're on a white knuckle roller coaster. I was like, hey, look, let's talk. So we get to his house, and it was about a week later after I called him. And during that week, I just researched everything that I could find. I looked up debates. I looked up evidence and arguments for the existence of God. And so I had about a week to prepare, and I got to his house. And so just setting the scene, he opens the door, and there's like immediately an elephant in the room. It's like all we want to talk about is this atheism stuff, but we had to have dinner first. It was really awkward. But the point is, is that this was a conversation that went terribly wrong with him. It, first of all, it lasted way too long. It was like three and a half hours long. And we disagreed the whole time. We, the, our voices got very loud. It was just, it was a very, very bad experience. But one of the things that I remember is he, he gave me these objections to Christianity that I hadn't thought of before. He was talking about Noah's Ark. He was talking about the problem of the unevangelized. What do you do about people that have never heard? So something I'm going to mention here as well is, so his brother presented him with a series of sort of problems for Christianity or that might be considered arguments, right? And arguments which Cameron didn't have good responses to as well. Now, the arguments that were against the conclusion he wanted to establish did not persuade him. And yet he expects that if he provides other people with arguments, right, that that will persuade them. And I think there's a kind of inconsistency here again, um, where it's like, no, clearly what's going to happen in the case where someone just hasn't heard your arguments before, doesn't have a response to them, is like, I don't know what to say. They're just going to go away, find some answers that support their conclusion and come back. And so, again, it's not, you know, it's not useful to persuade other people to just kind of collect these arguments. But... Heard the gospel. How is it fair for God to condemn them to hell forever, for all of eternity? How is that fair? He talked about Genesis and evolution. There's a bunch of different objections that he brought to my faith that I hadn't thought about before. And so, but what I took away from this story, this uh, meeting with my brother, was this was actually like a textbook case of how not to share your faith with skeptics. And so I want to... Something that I am pleased about in the Cameron Batuzzi, um story arc is that he's reached this sort of point of self-awareness now where, you know, he at least reflects on some of these things and realizes that um, he has had flaws in the past. I, I just think part of the problem is he doesn't really have the mirror to like do it to the things that he doesn't right now, where... <clears throat> they share some of the same flaws, but I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll comment on those things as we go on. I want to talk about what went wrong that night. And there were basically three things. First, it wasn't about love. That night, I really, I went over there and I wanted to win an argument. I wasn't over there to love on my brother. I wanted to win an argument. Second, I didn't really care about truth. It wasn't about truth for me. I wanted to go over there and I wanted to defend what I grew up believing. Right. And collecting premises that support a particular conclusion and, um, than re memorizing like potential objections and rebuttals to those objections and so forth that is all done in love right yeah and then third it wasn't about knowledge i didn't actually care about knowledge about christianity i cared about appearing as if i had knowledge and these are things that i and i, th I think that that criticism could still certainly be levied against capturing christianity and um its online presence right but particularly if you see the kind of um, discussions and things that Cameron himself has had with people. Um, though I suppose what, well, I mean, you could you could argue either way on this, right? And then having other people on, on his channel um, might make it appear like, I, I think does make it appear like Cameron might have some kind of expertise that some of the guests that appear on his channel um, have you know like a kind of halo effect right so if you, if you see these interviews with these people where they have good things to say about all these topics you might assume that cameron also has something good to say about these topics and when he he shares some of his his personal views um when it isn't the scholars speaking through him or a script or sometimes even when it is scripted you know it it turns out to not be the case that cameron actually does have good things to say about a lot of these topics um and oftentimes what one way that this can be seen is through Cameron's use of um, specific philosophical terminology where it isn't used to clarify um, a point. Instead, it's used as a kind of um, intimidation tool of like, well, if you're going to disagree with me, you, look, here's a philosophical big gun. 
axiology of theism, so, you know, something like that, right? Um, and that's about appearing, it, you know, it's about peacocking out the, the feathers, right? It's about appearing to um, <clears throat> have a certain stock of knowledge that someone's engaging with rather than it being about the, the actual content there. I, like, I discovered as I went through and started to really think about like, why did that night turn out so horribly? But what I'm convinced of is that if you master these three areas, then you can have a conversation with anybody, including skeptics. So let's look at the first one, which is loving people. And again, that night I wasn't there to love on my brother. I was not. I was there to win an argument. I, I didn't really care what he had to say. Thank you, whoever, who is it? YouTube Punk for leaving Pine, Pine Creek stream to come to mind. I didn't actually know Doug was live. Did he go live when I went live? If he did, that sneaky, sneaky man. Sneaky. He did. When did he start? Oh, an hour 30 minutes ago, though. So I should have actually um, probably paid attention to that before I went live. But oh well, I didn't know. Okay. Say I wasn't trying to listen to him, and I couldn't see the value in his journey of truth seeking. And I think that's actually the journey that he was on. He was on a journey to find the truth, but I couldn't see the value in the courage that it took for him to actually embark on something like that. So let's get a quick reminder of what love is. And this is this verse that you guys probably heard a thousand times if you grew up in church, 1 Corinthians 13, four through seven, love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on- Again, like I'm happy to see the character growth on Cameron's part that, um, I mean, just supposing he's authentic and I'm gonna be laying my cards on the table if you haven't already guessed from my tone and things. You know, I do have some difficulty in taking Cameron to be sincere when he says some of these things. But I mean, supposing he is sincere in saying that, then that's at least some like positive character growth on his part, right? Woman, I'm kidding. <laughs> I just heard the clinking, but it's fine. I'll beat her later for that. <laughs> it's on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. None of this is like remotely close to what happened that night with my brother. I was impatient, I was short, I was loud. I didn't try to understand his views. I didn't try to understand how or why he actually got to any of his views. I was waiting for my own opportunity to talk. But love, it requires you to listen. You've actually got to listen to what the other person is saying, not just the type of listening where you're like waiting for your chance to speak, but the actual type of love where you're genuinely interested in what the other person is saying. And here's something, it's, it's really easy to love on people that you agree with, but like, when was the last time you were in a conversation with someone that you would disagree with and you're like, man, I really love you. This is great. I love you so much. It doesn't happen. I think that this is a little bit bizarre though. Um, it does seem sort of infelicitous. I mean, so there are people, I mean, there are people who um, are not explicitly Christians, right? Who I would sort of disagree with potentially on this point. And I don't know if it's done as a joke or not, but like um, Majesty of Reason, who's a you know great channel, but like he'll often in his comments and posts and things talk about like loving people and things like that. And I, I sort of don't like that because I feel like, you know, love as a, as a word, the reason it has this sort of power is because it's reserved for like a, a very particular set of um, like sensations and behaviors and history and all, all sorts of things that are, are built up between people. And it, it feels like a misuse to kind of fire that word off just in the in cases of disagreement. It almost feels manipulative in a way because it, in, in contexts where you're not with someone who, you know, would be appropriate to, to love. So I, I'm talking about just a case of someone maybe in a classroom who you disagree with or just a kind of acquaintance or something, right? So it wouldn't, it, it, it's not sort of appropriate to be like, just like, oh, I love you or something like looking deeply into their eyes. Um, it's like a misfiring of that word, but, but then all of a sudden in the case of the disagreement, if you start like firing that off, because it's such a powerful word and all the things that it evokes and means it, it, it just seems kind of manipulative. Like, like the person d isn't now, if they, um, engage with you in the, in the disagreement in certain ways, then it's like, they're doing something wrong and that, it, you know, then it looks like they're doing something immoral. It, it, it just seems 
like a bad thing to be deploying in in you know contexts outside of like these loving relationships um with like partners or children or whatever or maybe like really close friendships it, well if it does happen it's very rare so yeah it's, it's really easy to love on people that you agree with but when you disagree with them it's a lot more difficult so in, in a couple of verses earlier than this Paul says without love, we're absolutely nothing. And so love, I think, has to be our foundation. And in a conversation, if it is, it's going to make it actually a fruitful conversation. I was reading a commentary on this passage, and uh, what it said was actually really profound. It said, quote, love provides both the stability and consistency in which life slash conversations thrive. Love provides both the, both the stability and consistency in which life and conversations thrive. And so when we love the person that we're dialoguing with, all of a sudden our insecurities are no longer causing us to get super defensive and angry and loud. It's no longer about defending my reasonableness. It's no yeah, but the, this it, it doesn't quite sound like that's loving the person, right? Because loving the person, to me, is sort of like, um, I don't know, maybe you, like, die for them, right? You, you'd you give a lot of money for them. Um, you, you would, like, take significant harm upon yourself in order to for their betterment. Like, think a, a bunch of things like that, right, um, sort of come under love. But... You know, I, I'm not going to just be a nasty dick to you in a conversation. Like, that's not love. That's kind of like the bare minimum for just having a conversation with someone, right? And then to elevate the status of love to just, like, get to, to just participating in conversations, not, like, uh, some kind of asshole, it just seems weird to me. No longer about me at all. It's about the other person. And that's what love can do. If you're writing things down, like Brett over here, you can write this down. Quote, love overcomes personal defects that destroy conversations. Love overcomes personal defects that destroy conversations. And so with love as our foundation, we can expect to have good conversation. And this is why it seems manipulative to me, I think, as well, because the person could be like, no, look, I sincerely disagree with you here. Could you just like a actually provide a response to, um, could you, you know, someone who's being like dodging and things like that. You, you're like, no, no, look, we disagree. Please, can you provide a response to the objection that I've given? And the person could be like, look, I'm just trying to love you in this conversation or whatever. And that, that's where it gets manipulative. Um, and I think I do see that done by cultists. I'm not necessarily calling Cameron a cultist, but, you know, like people like Mormons or Jehovah's Witnesses and, and so on, where they sort of bandy about this word love in the context of the random one-off um, communication that they're having with you. And then, it, and then it makes you feel all of a sudden like you've got obligations to agree with this person or to adopt some of their beliefs or to um, to respect their beliefs, perhaps, when intellectually, at least, they don't deserve to be respected, but because they've told you that they're trying to love you or whatever, you kind of feel coerced into doing it. Otherwise, you know, you're like hurting the feelings of this person who loves you. Now, what about online? Loving others is uh, a lot easier to do when it's not online. But when you're online, you're on Facebook, and you're in a disagreement with somebody or a skeptic, or it doesn't have to be a skeptic, it can be anybody on anything you disagree with. It's a lot easier to have a bad conversation with somebody. And so I asked a Christian philosopher, his name is Douglas Grotheis, this question, how can we have good conversations with people online? And so let's watch this video together. And I noticed this personally because I do a lot of online interaction with atheists and non-believers. And it's very, very easy to interact with this person online as just someone who's a talking head, as opposed to someone who's actually a person with thoughts mm -hmm. and feelings and mm -hmm. someone whom God loves. So how do we get yeah. past that? How can we better view our people, these discussion people, partners? How can we better view them mm -hmm. as persons whom we should love mm -hmm. instead of someone who, who we should beat with an argument? By the way, if there are any people here who want to talk to me in the sense of um like disagreement then feel free to i'm going to put the join link and it's just going to be one-to-one -one, uh disagreement join link i put that there and i will pin it So there we go, but I'll keep playing. Well, meditate on scripture, showing the profound significance of all human beings. We're all made in the image and likeness of God. God so loved the world, atheists, pantheists, everyone. So we want to minister out of that orientation of love, loving God, loving our neighbor. And use your imagination to realize there is a person behind that screen. There's a person who is writing flippant responses or nasty responses, or a person who's giving tough criticisms that we may not know how to answer. And then also, I think some interactions, most really, are better done offline. Now, if you're evangelizing an atheist in India, you know, I sort of, I, I agree that um, this is how people perhaps like should try to participate in online communication. But um, okay, let's see. Where's 
conversation that Danny had the other day, for example, which was very funny. Oh, where was it? Yeah, this this is the one. It's really funny. I'll just play this, and then I've got someone in the background. But but all too often for certain Christian communities, this is the way that um, you know communication actually does turn out, right? So I made the mistake of trying to talk to Sam Shimoon about the coherency of the Trinity. Enjoy the drama. Uh, D Science, your mother is logically incoherent because how can she give birth to a beast like you unless she was an animal? So Skype me, D Science, so I can bury you in your logic. Like, I w so I won't play the whole thing, but you know, this sort of um, there's definitely a kind of insecure masculinity that gets its tender hooks into the minds of certain Christians where they feel like, I have truth. I have logic, I have what it means to be a man and my guns and, uh, you know, and it, and it becomes this very like ma macho, weird, masculine um, sort of in-group thing, you know, having, having the particular beliefs that they have. And, that, and then it's all kind of about tribalism and so on. And I think that that is actually a big part of what attracts s some Christians, right, into, into the kind of beliefs that they have. Anyway, welcome Jacob Templin or Jacob, however it is pronounced, if it's pronounced differently with a K. Yo, what's good, man? How are you doing? I'm all right, thanks. How are you doing? I'm doing well. I haven't really heard, I mean, I just joined, like, I don't know, four minutes ago. Um, I haven't really heard anything I disagree with yet. Oh, well, well the po yeah, the point of the uh, join link is to call in when you disagree, right? And then there's one-to-one -one well, space available. I'm just, I'm just waiting. I'm sure. I'm sure there will be something eventually. I mean, we still okay. have a lot of we still have a lot of the video to go, right? Okay. Well, I'll I'll pop you in the background for now, and then if there's something you disagree with, put it in the private chat, and I'll uh, bring you back in to talk. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. All right. For sure. See you in a bit. Okay. Oh, that's the wrong video. This one. Probably you'll need to use something online, but you might be able to go to Skype. You might be able to set up the visual dimension of it. It might be more appropriate to write letters and use the old snail mail sometimes because you can spend more time composing an apologetic letter. We certainly need patience, gentleness, and sometimes I think we need to stop. We feel ourselves getting agitated, angry, uh, thinking I'm so clever I can refute this idea. Probably time to pause, if not stop, and say, why don't we take this up some other time? One of the things you said just now about trying to get on Skype so you can see this person face to face, Another sort of anecdote that I have is there was this atheist I was talking with for years and I was thinking every time I would interact with him, I was thinking, oh, this guy's just such a troll. It's not worth engaging this guy. And then one day, I don't know how it happened. I hosted a Google Hangout with just a bunch of people came in and we all were discussing. But when I saw him face to face, it changed everything. Mm -hmm. My interactions since that point with him have been completely different. So I think that that's a really important point. Mm -hmm. I think Cameron's right here as well, um, as much as it pains me to say it, that you know, being able to humanize people helps to not be addicted to them. That you made there. If we can find some some possible some possible way of interacting with this person instead of just typing mm -hmm. away, you know, the keyboard warrior right. setting. So well it's been said that the face is the gateway to the soul because it's so expressive. Mm -hmm. We speak from our face, we hear but you certainly don't need this metaphysics in order to um, you know, think that having a more personal personable relationship with someone, being able to view them as a human, um, you know, helps to de escalate from some of that tribalism. Hear from our ears. And what you see in technologies that are not visually oriented is the reduction of the person to text. Now, in some cases, that's fine. We have books. I don't need to know what Shakespeare looked like to benefit from Shakespeare. I don't know why I said that. I know almost nothing about Shakespeare. <laughs> but I don't have to have been in C.S. Lewis's presence to benefit from his writings. But uh, for a more personal interaction and dialogue, seeing the person, and actually not just seeing, but being with, so there can be appropriate touch. And you can get the nuances of a person's personality and attitudes as you're, you're with them. There are all kinds of stimuli coming in that we can assess and learn how to respond to through the promptings of the Holy Spirit. So one of the things, well, let me mention this first. So this is actually part of a longer interview that you can go watch on my YouTube channel, Shameless Plug, Capturing Christianity. You can search it on YouTube, go subscribe to my channel. I feel like the more um, sort of ordinary, in quotes, church going Christians that Cameron drives towards, um, YouTube discourse potentially the more the more deconversions there are going to be because it 
at least for people who um, begin to consume this content consistently and then start to think about certain problems or things that they've not thought about before, it seems like that could be a big catalyst for people to um, leave a kind of ordinary faith, which is mostly about participating in the church community in a particular kind of way, and then modifying and molding it to being more about like academic discourse and things as opposed to just what actually goes on in the church you know and you're subscribed nice nice so one of the things i loved about his response here is that you got to know when to stop you got to know when to stop and it's it, it can be very difficult to know when to stop an unproductive conversation but if the conversation's not going anywhere what's the point of continuing right you need to you need to learn when to stop at some point both people are just going to be more entrenched in their views now another thing that i liked it's how he suggests trying to have an in-person conversation with somebody. So like use Skype, use Zoom, use some form of media medium where you can actually see the person face to face. If you're wanting to have like a really productive conversation with someone that you disagree with, that's a really uh, important key. All right, let's move on to key number two, which is loving truth. That night, again, it wasn't about loving uh, truth in my conversation with my brother. It was about defending what I grew up believing. And at the time I would have said that I wanted him to believe what's true, but really I wanted him to believe what I believed. That's really what it was about. And before we get into the distinction between belief and truth, let's talk about what truth is in the first place. Truth is that which corresponds to reality. And this is called. So, you know, I'm not a correspondence theorist about truth because I think that the notion of a correspondence relation between language and the world is just incoherent gibberish. But um, so, I, you know, I, I'm a pragmatist about truth. Um a deflationist like William Lane Craig actually as well but you know one thing one thing that's going to be a bit weird then is Cameron just introducing this particularly I mean this is going to be a, a critique that Christians should potentially give as well is Cameron just introducing this definition of truth in the context of some sort of sermon um, where it could easily be mistaken by the audience as being something that's sort of essential to Christianity right Whereas actually it's not, it, you can adopt pretty much any of the mainstream views on truth that there are in philosophy and be a Christian. So it seems like, you know, it, it maybe it wouldn't for the purposes of the, it, maybe it would muddy the waters too much, but it seems like at least saying here's a few of the kind of definitions that are out there that people go with. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. It just seems a bit weird to just be like, this is the definition, right? When it's something that there's there's broad disagreement on, even amongst Christian philosophers. Well, there's a technical term for it, really fancy technical terms called the correspondence theory of truth. Right, you can write that down if you want. The correspondence theory of truth. Now, some people are truth relativists. Have any, have any of you guys heard that term, truth relativism? Like, you've, you've probably heard it put this way. I have my truth, you have your truth, everyone has their own truth, ta-da. So there's actually something really wrong with this, and that is that it's self-defeating. So is it absolutely true that truth is relative? That so this is a really rubbish objection. So suppose suppose someone's a truth relativist, right? And then and, and then they say, yeah, like truth relativism is true. I have my truth, you have your truth. And someone says, Was well, that absolutely true? Well, the person's gonna say, Well, no, it's not absolutely true but it's true for me, right? And that's all it needs to be in order to satisfy what I'm calling truth, which is, you know, my truth is true. Truth for me is my truth. And I say that that's true. So this self-defeating objection doesn't actually even apply to the relevant relativist if thought about for a second or two. That's a question you can ask someone who espouses this view. Is truth, is it absolutely true that truth is relative? If it's absolutely true, then absolute truth exists. And so truth relativism is false. Now, most people these days won't say, right, if it's absolutely true, but what if they just say, no, it's just true. It's not absolutely true because that's some, because that would be inconsistent of me as a truth relativist to say it's absolutely true. I just think it's ordinarily true. You know, these sort of rubbish arguments really irk me, but it, but you come to sort of expect them from apologists, right? That truth is actually relative. I think that they'll want to admit that some things are absolutely true. Like if you're in a conversation with a skeptic, they might say evolution is absolutely true. Like that's not, that's a non-negotiable thing. So these days I don't really think you're going to get to uh, interact with a whole lot of people that are going to be truth relativists. But the point is, is that truth, <coughs> excuse me, truth is that which corresponds to reality and truth is not relative. It's objective. All right. Now let's move on to a distinction. Again, the, you know, there's going to be all sorts of 
subjective truths as well like um you know my favorite color right <laughs> i i have a favorite color but that's clearly like a subjective truth um just a sort of weird way of introducing this topic to a lay audience as far as i'm concerned i don't think that I don't think that the sort of brief discourse on introducing the correspondence theory is doing much work in, in terms of helping the audience here. Between what I believe and what's true. There's a difference between what you believe and what's true. What you believe is not necessarily what's true. Most of our beliefs are true, but we aren't always right. Unless you're God, you're not right about everything. You have, you gotta just get used to this. You got some false beliefs, okay? What you believe is not necessarily what's true. And what happens in conversations with skeptics or anybody is if we're not careful, we're going to seek to defend what we believe instead of seeking the truth. So again, I sort of agree. I want to agree and disagree here because, you know, I, I agree that a lot of people don't have the self-awareness to distinguish between their own beliefs and the fact that their beliefs might be wrong. Um, however, at the same time, when someone believes something, right, they believe that thing is true. They don't, they don't think it's false. And so they're, they're obviously going to defend it as if it were true. Um, but yeah, I think people should have that kind of discursive self-awareness that they're fallible. And so new information might modify those beliefs in some way. Seeking truth means being able to put our beliefs to the side and really discovering what's true, searching for the truth. And I don't know about you guys, I want to have true beliefs. Like I want to, I want to believe what's true. I don't want to just have beliefs. I want to have true beliefs. And it might seem weird actually as Christians to say, put your beliefs to the side and seek the truth. But I want to remind you what the apostle Paul has to say about this. First Corinthians 15, 17 and 19. And if Christ has not been raised, then your faith is useless and you are still guilty of your sins. Verse 19. You see, again, it doesn't seem like someone who's a, who, who's a, a truth seeker in this plain objective sense would need to be motivated by the words of the apostle Paul in order to sort of deploy this heuristic, right? This seems to be like motivated reasoning or the kind of reasoning that takes place in a high control community where thinking a particular way is only permitted just in case some some authority figure permits you to think in that way, right? And if our hope in Christ is only for this life, we are more to be pitied than anyone in the world. That is very, very strong language. I don't know if you can get that from Paul. Very strong language. Paul's saying that if all we have are hopes and dreams, we're literally pitiful. We are pitiful. This is actually really good biblical reason for seeking truth over and above whatever it was that we just grew up believing. And ironically, this, I can't emphasize this enough. It's so ironic that that's the, that's the path that my brother was on. He was the one trying to seek truth. I was not the one trying to seek truth in that conversation. I was trying to defend what I grew up believing. But something that I find more ironic is recently in these past few weeks, Cameron coming out with this sort of conversation, but le again, lacking the self-awareness to really put that mirror up against his own practices, his own channel, the salesmanship, the marketing, you know, like the demon exorcist guy he keeps inviting on, things like that. Um, to not hold that, that mirror up and see where he cares more about either winning uh, debates, so like having professional philosophers write his script for debates that he's having with YouTubers like Rationality Rules, um, or or the kind of like marketing and things that he does to in, in order to attract people rather than it being about truth. Now, in light of the fact that we don't know everything, why is it so difficult to admit three little words? I don't know. Every, okay, everybody say this, say, I don't know. Say it, say it, say it. I don't know. I am an individual. It's very difficult to admit that, especially when you're in a conversation with somebody and like they ask you a question you should know the answer to. It's very difficult to admit that I don't know, but get comfortable with it. Admitting you don't know can actually open someone up to hearing what you have to say. Because as you, as you probably know, there is a Christian stereotype of Christians just are know-it-alls. They have to know everything. But if you admit in a conversation, I don't know, you know what? That's a really good point. I need to take that home. I'm gonna take that home. I'm gonna think about it and I'll get back to you. And if you do that, you can really open them up to hearing. Right, and now how about this, Cameron? You present me with your argument um, as an atheist. And I say, yeah, that's, in that's an interesting uh, set of claims that entails God's existence. I don't know what my response is. Uh, I'm going to think about it. I'll come back to you at some point. <laughs> Thanks for sharing. Are you going to just leave it there? Hearing what you have to say. There was about 20 different times during my conversation with my, with my brother where I made up a response off the top of my head instead of just admitting, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. And that's what I should have done. Can anyone guess what is behind our desire to always want to have a, an answer to everything? 
is it having a YouTube channel um, where a bunch of people look up to you as some kind of intellectual authority on these things? And then you kind of realize all of a sudden that you're weighing over your head when you start getting questions about topics that you have no idea about and feel like you have to maintain the public profile that you've created through your social media accounts and uh, YouTube profile. Next slide. Pride. It's, it's very, very simple. We want people to think that we're smart. We want people to think that we have it all together. But humility is not about thinking bad about yourself. It's thinking accurately of yourself. Humility is just plain honesty. Being honest about who you are, being honest about where you got your abilities from, from God, and being honest about what you know. This leads us to the third key, loving knowledge. In my conversation with my brother, I did not value knowledge. I did nothing but give half-baked answers to really tough So here's the thing as well. In terms of what Cameron's saying, loving knowledge, I do not think for one moment now um, that Cameron, having read a few apologetics books, having a few more things to say about metaphysics than he did when he initially spoke to his brother, having a few more arguments up his sleeve, I do not think Cameron has more knowledge. I just think he has more noises that he can make together that are going to sound plausible and use big intimidating words for someone who... Um, hasn't been socialized into the practices of philosophy. I don't think he has more knowledge. Questions for three hours. I hadn't studied Christianity like I should have. I didn't love God with my mind. And when it came to give knowledge in this really important time of my life, I didn't, because I didn't value knowledge, I didn't have it to give. Here's two examples. I'm gonna give you two examples of what it looks like to love knowledge as a Christian. This first clip is from a philosopher and historian, Gary Habermas, where he- Hey, Jacob. Hey. You won't wait too long, were you? No, no, no. So, um... I mean, I think the issue here, well, f f one, I mean, Cameron's not really doing any philosophy right now. Like you said, it's just pure apologetics. So it's kind of difficult to do philosophy on apologetics, right? I mean, usually you philosophize about other philosophy. Um, but when you say that he didn't acquire any more knowledge or he's not more knowledgeable than he was when he had that first disagreement with his brother... I mean, how do we operationalize knowledge? How do we go about operationalize it to then generalize it again? That's a good question. Um, I mean, I would say personally that what I mean by knowledge is going to be, um, I suppose, a particular type in this in this context as well for philosophy a particular type of um, linguistic skill that someone will have acquired um, in order to achieve their goal, right? And their goal would be, in this case, to um, uncover some sort of truths about the way that reality is fundamentally, right? Whereas, and I, and I think that Cameron is not succeeding when it, it in this case, because I like I say, I just think he's kind of collected a bunch of Pokemon that he's able to kind of, um, deploy when he requires them or when he feels his views are, are sort of threatened in certain ways. But I don't think that I, I, I don't think that there's a there's a lot of like meat on the bones of a few of these kind of big words that he he throws around. Like like when he talks about axiology, whatever, when it comes to the problem of evil. I don't think that he actually has a lot substantive to say about the problem of evil or why it fails. Like I happen to think the problem of evil actually does fail as an argument against Christianity as well. But I don't think that Cameron has really taken on board any of the kind of, you know, the reasons that I think the problem of evil fails, for example, are to do with the reasons why I think like most of these sorts of logical arguments fail. I think that if Cameron accepted that sort of critique, then it would like undercut, you know, it would be inconsistent with um, the kind of discourse that he wants to present, where it's like presenting these endless lists of uh, arguments from natural theology and so on. So I, I've not fully answered the original question like how, how should we operationalize knowledge i guess um just as I, as i said in, t in terms of acqu acquiring that kind of linguistic skill that achieves someone uh, allows someone to achieve success in whatever context they're trying to would be my view yeah so it sounds very wittgensteinian um i don't know now now i'm thinking um because you're you're talking about the the logical arguments that a lot of apologists try to make maybe that's their issue maybe that's their issue maybe what they're getting at is not a logical thing it's actually an illogical thing and most times very irrational as well so i'm thinking like 
because we still have this whole issue of how we operationalize knowledge, how we operationalize truth. And maybe that's their problem is we, and maybe it's just a problem generally is that we think the only way to get to truth, whatever that is, is through logic. It's a logical process. I wonder if there are any truths that you, that can be derived at illogically or irrationally. Yeah. I mean, I mean, so I, I have a few thoughts on that. I mean, what, one of my thoughts is that I think rationality is just essentially a, a, a socially condoned way of thinking about things. I mean, there are different cultures with different um, models of rationality, which achieve different conclusions to ours. Um, now, obviously, our, our, our tools of rationality are very powerful, but I mean, there's quite powerful Christian critiques of of reason and rationality from people like Kierkegaard, for example, who make the same observations about how what is um, deemed as, as as rational changes over time between between different cultures. Um, now, I don't I don't know that I want to say that the conclude that Christianity is essentially irrational or something like that, but I think I, I think I'm with Kierkegaard in some of the observations that he makes about, you know, like if we're talking about God here and God incarnating, I mean, why on earth do we sort of think that this is the kind of thing that um, somehow is going to make perfect sense to human reason? You know, it's, it's this kind of absurd um, story to, to our sort of everyday, everyday selves. But yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I have critiques of the sort of definition of, of truth offered by Cameron. I think it, it is sort of weird that you would have these things called propositions that somehow correspond to reality and some correspondence relation as if there's kind of like this model, you know, this this modeling picture relation between these propositions or thought and the world. And I, I just don't think that that's what um, happens, right? I, th I think that people just use linguistic tokens, linguistic tokens being things that we're like trained to do almost Behave, behaviorally, behaviorally in certain contexts, right, um, with varying degrees of success, whether, whether those degrees of success are determined by, like, social contexts, which have their own nuances amongst, like, other human beings who are going to respond in particular ways, whether those um, contexts be in, in, like, you know, the sciences or in, like, military contexts or political contexts, whatever. So, um you know, my view of truth is going to be that it's just an, it's just another word, and it's a word that we use, you know, just to mean that we uh, often to mean that we've achieved success, right? With in a, in applying a word in a certain way, and not that there's this special kind of correspondence between thought and world, um, because that is just a cult to me and mysterious. Like, yeah, I, I like that. Um, it seems to me that we can make utterances about the world and those utterances can correspond to what seems to be the case about reality but that doesn't it doesn't follow that that our utter our our utterances of about reality are then true so they so they, they, it's like you said with your subjective truths that if you say your favorite color well my favorite color is green um, I'm not sure that that is even a truth. That that's just it, it's just a seeming, right? It, it's it's just it seems to be the case about the nature of my subjectivity that my favorite color is green, but my that color has no correspondence to the world, really. I think that's what I mean when I was saying, um, you know, that's like a paradigm case of a subjective truth because. It, you know, in that in, in that case, it would be entirely appropriate for someone to say, well, it's true that that's your favorite color. You know, like, um, is, it, is it true that your favorite color is green? You know, you might say yes or nod your head or whatever. But then it's it's not like there's a sort of objective fact of the matter about what for, what your favorite color is or something, you know, like that, like that's some fact about the world. It's just. It's complete. It's completely subjective. Um, right. Was it Kierkegaard that said subjectivity is truth? I don't. I don't. Oh, I, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, it was. It was one of the the great uh, um, idealists. 
but yeah, so, so there was this proclamation of subjectivity being truth. I mean, that's the whole like phenomenological um, movement, you know, it's like, but I just don't know because again, this is, I mean, it's a major issue, right? Like what do we even mean by truth and what do we mean by, by knowledge? I mean, or gnosis, right? Digital gnosis here. Um, but I don't mean it in that sense. But yeah, I, I don't think it is. I, I mean, my view tends to be that it's not, it's only an issue for philosophers who sort of create this issue, right? They kind of sell you the problem. That first, they have to sell you on the problem before they can sell you the solution is is my view. And I think that, it, you know, a classic example of this sort of philosophical problem is um, Augustine in the Confessions when he says, you know, what is time? When nobody asks me, I know perfectly well, but when someone asks me and I think about it, then all of a sudden I, ca I can't say what time is. And I think that this is the this is like a paradigm case for a kind of philosophical problem where if I said, oh, I don't know where I put my keys, I know perfectly well, you know, how to use and apply the word no. Um, if I say, if, if, if someone says, you know, are you telling the truth or something, right? I know perfectly well how to respond to truth as it's as it's used in all sorts of ordinary contexts it's only um in the philosophical context where we sort of take these bits of language on holiday and we kind of try to use them in ways that they're sort of not not meant to be used and we look for these clear sharp boundaries about what they mean and the essential characteristics of them and so forth that that there, there we go wrong because there just isn't any such thing because these are just bits of ordinary language that have you know, come about as part of our natural history. They don't. They don't cut reality at the joints of some like some essential characterization. Is it? That's at least my view. No, I agree with that. Again, it's you know, it harkens back to Wittgenstein, and the reason we even have a philosophy, according to him, is because of our analysis of language and these linguistic confusions. Yeah, that's tends to be what I think. Uh, is there anything else you disagree with me on, or shall I carry on playing out the video? Um, well, I mean, I don't think you and I really disagree on much. I mean, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm not a theist. I'm not an, an, apolo uh, an apologist. Um, I'm, I just like these uh, types of conversations. I like what you do. Um, no, I but, appreciate it. I just yeah, wanted man. to, I want, I want to have the room open for like uh, oh, people who yeah, yeah, support. yeah. I uh, just one more thing. You said something interesting. You're like, well, our tools, our Western tools, the the logic and, and, and rational mind and whatnot, are very powerful tools. I agree with that. But um, when you when you look at um, uh, structures like the, the the pyramids or Gobekli Tempe or you know uh, Machu Picchu or something, it's like the these were civilizations. These were cultures. Um, of uh that were illogical that were irrational that were totally immersed in um this form of action um you know made up of gods and goddesses and heroes and and and, and satyrs and whatnot but yet they were able to accomplish some incredible features i mean they were able to to keep their their civilizations their kingdoms their empires in existence for millennia you know, and like here we are in the West teetering on like, you know, the, the fringes of something. I don't know what exactly, but it, it's just I, I think maybe in the West we have this idea that logic and rationality are like the only ways of really accomplishing great things when when you just look back, you know, really prehistory. But you just see what these ancient civilizations were able to achieve with seemingly irrational and illogical worldviews. It's just so astounding. Yeah, I mean, I, I sort of agree with that, and there's a, a lot that could be said to unpack it more. But yeah, thanks for sharing that, Jacob. Just let me know in the private chat if there's more you want to say. Sounds good. Thanks for having me up, man. No problem. Okay, yeah, um, Deepak was asking if this is an open call, and it so I'm. it's open for people who sort of like disagree with my commentary on this video about Cameron. But other than that, um, I'm sort of not really having people in. And the link is at the top if anyone does disagree in that way. Uh, OK. He lays out the gospel in about a minute. Go ahead and play the clip. A big plug. Well, to me, there's there's two sides. Don't really want to listen to Before we move on to the next clip, let's talk about how knowledge can actually help remove our insecurities. Knowledge can eliminate fear and insecurity. I remember when I was a teenager, I would so this is sort of interesting. It's like 
so as long as you can convince yourself that the conclusions that you, so that this is sort of the the move Cameron's making right before so he just introduced the idea of a distinction between belief and truth so what you believe might not be true there's this kind of corrigibility corrigibility meaning um like might be wrongness about um about beliefs but that isn't there in the case of knowledge so if we can somehow just take our beliefs and convert them to knowledge then that will eliminate our fear and insecurity so it's but then there's this kind of psychological trick or worry about this move which is going to be that well all i need to do then is just convince myself that i have knowledge when i actually just have a belief uh, and i mean in my view this is just going to be more of a word game than anything and and as long as i can convince myself of that well then i'm not going to i'm going to have the same uh, lack of fear and insecurity which i was trying to avoid in the first place when i was behaving in this kind of reprehensible way and that's exactly where I'm going to end up if I if I take this route that Cameron's prescribing. I was asked to uh, share my faith with unbelievers, and it was the most terrifying time of my life. Like, and the reason for that, as I've like reflected on it, is because I didn't really know the gospel. Like, I didn't have knowledge of the gospel, and that was what was really driving all the fear and anxiety that I was experiencing about sharing the gospel. And so a lack of knowledge can actually create fear. And not only can knowledge remove fear, it can also remove insecurities like anger. If you don't, if you actually know what you believe and why you believe it, and you value knowledge, you're not going to need have a whole lot of need to get defensive and angry at objections to your faith. So, so this is again a bizarre misfiring of belief, which is potentially revealing of um, some of the weird tendencies amongst Cameron's community. So it's like, yeah, I don't know what I believe. Imag I mean, imagine like, um, well, it, is green your favorite color? Do you? It, I I don't know. I don't, I I don't know my own thoughts and beliefs. It's because what Cameron means by beliefs here, when when he's using it, is whatever the authority of the religious community that I'm a part of tells me to believe, right? Um, and so he's like, yeah, I don't know what I believe yet because <laughs> because I've decided I've decided that whatever I believe is just whatever you know this authority structure tells me, but I haven't actually. I, I actually can't access those things. I've, I've offloaded my, my cognition to, to that structure. So, all right, let's move on to the next clip from Christian philosopher, Dr. William Lane Craig on the problem of the unevangelized. And again, this is an example of what it looks like to love God. I can't listen to As that. you definitely want to look up Dr. William Lane Craig, if you've never heard of him, look, no. almost done. Bible. If you don't have one, buy a good systematic theology text and read through the whole thing. And actually you can get with me afterwards if you want a, a good example of one. To grow, you also need to study apologetics. That's number two. The term apologetics comes from the root word apologia. apologia. Anybody. So first of all, How sets a realistic goal. These? This one is actually really important. There's a Christian uh, apologist. His name is Greg Kokel. And in his book, Tactics, he argues that we shouldn't set a realistic Man, goal. This is just like, I swear, this is the same freaking sales pitch for all the same apologists, same books, same sound bites as I've heard a million times. I mean, obviously, it could be new to these people, but it's ridiculous. It's like beating a dead horse. You've just got to be a one trick. Pu you can really make a career out of this. You can really be invited, you know, pro expenses paid or whatever to travel across the country and deliver talks on these topics in the US. Oh, man about Christianity himself. And he even at one point suggested that Jesus may not have existed. And my response to that was to go on the offense. Like I wanted to give arguments for Jesus existing in history, but instead what you, okay. conversations flourish where love, truth, and knowledge are the focus. And my background's in photography. That's why you get like these random photography puns, like focus and stuff. Anyways, uh, thank you guys. That's, that's the end. <laughs> <laughs> so I think we're going to have, yeah, I do. I, Car Cameron, is probably the apologist who annoys me the most. I, I don't know what it is. I think it's his sort of, so he, he's obviously a, a fair bit older than me, but he's kind of a millennial, but he's like a millennial who's sort of trying to present as like young and trend. I just find it so cringy, especially when it's mixed with like this absurd Christian way of viewing reality as well. Um, I don't know what it is about him that annoys me so much. Um, I have time for some Q&A. Yeah. Questions. And if you do, please raise your hand. I'll run over because we do want to get it on audio. Uh, and just as questions popped up in your mind, uh, please don't lose the opportunity uh, to, uh, because not, what I love about Cameron is Cameron's not only just kind of his, doing his own thing, he's actually interviewing scholars from around the world. It's kind of his whole shtick. And so. Uh, if this is a, yeah, if this is a Protestant denomination, they're sure going to be disappointed when Cameron converts. Uh, he's representing a lot of different people and people on that knowledge. Uh, I know I would have 
I was going to say. That's the thing I said before. See, when this guy says um, he's representing a lot of different people, people assume because Cameron's interviewed people um, who are varied degrees of experts on certain areas, that because Cameron's interviewed them, that he therefore has something good to say about any of these topics, when usually that's not the case, right? started uh, you said you would you know pull you aside afterwards and recommend some things that mm -hmm. maybe get people started mm -hmm. if i'm here i honestly don't think that cameron is that much better equipped than most of the i mean i mean there's some really knowledgeable christians on like twitter for example who i engage with or christians with like very small followings on youtube who have really good things to say about a lot of these things i don't think cameron's like I, I don't think that the size of Cameron or success of Cameron's channel and the fact that he's had some of these big names on for interviews is any indication of competence here. Um, I don't know why exactly it's happened. Maybe it's because the branding's on point, so people have wanted to be involved or look, whatever the hell's happened. But I, I don't think it's a reflection of competence. I don't think that people should that should like view um, Cameron as some kind of authority just because he's he's been able to talk to some of these people. And I don't know a lot about apologetics, and I'm not a huge reader or anything like that. What are some good resources that I could step into right away to just intro into that world and get going? How about uh, you go to Trinity Radio, Braxton Hunter's YouTube channel? No, I would Is actually. Right? So if you're not into like reading too much, then actually go do find some YouTubers that are doing good work. Mike Winger is probably like the number one guy that I would recommend because he does a mix. If I was in line, what would my question be to Cameron? I don't know that I'd have one, to be honest. Um, I'd want to draw attention between some of the things that he was so some of the things that he's saying about having these conversations in you know the with the love of truth and knowledge and so forth and then the conflict between the branding on his channel so when he's like oh it's it's irrational to um it's irrational to leave Christianity or but, you know, like trying to do a clickbaity thing about Pascal's wager or atheists should delete their channels, things like that. Um, be like, you know, is that is that really having a so before, you know, before you even begin to have this loving um, conversation that's going to be edif mutually edifying between people who disagree, you're going to first just um, sort of put right at the start of that conversation. By the way, it's uh, rational to have the beliefs you believe. It's like. It's, it's just like kind of starting a conversation by saying fuck you or something. Fuck you. Now let's have a nice loving conversation. It's like, come on. Of theology and apologetics. So and he does, so he like focuses more on the Bible, but he also does apologetic stuff. But Mike Winger would probably be like the number one online resource that I would recommend. And then there's other Christians who are doing stuff on YouTube. John McRae, Braxton Hunter, myself. Um, those are some of the top ones that I would recommend online. And David Wood is also another fun guy. He does mainly Muslim apologetics. He does a lot of uh, interesting work. Does a lot of really cool stuff. What do you mean? Yeah, John McRae. That's uh, his his real name. Is not as cool as what do you mean? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, uh, but as far as books, what would I recommend? Tactics. Go by and read Tactics. That's like one of the best books you can read, especially on the subject for tonight. Be before you read Tactics, watch Greg Kukul talk to uh, Pine Creek Doug, which you actually can no longer watch on the Canadian Catholic YouTube channel because that YouTube channel has been deleted, um, which is another drama in our our spheres of influence online and how to share your faith with skeptics or anyone else that's probably the number one book that i would recommend another just really good book that i think if you read this you're going to come away it's going to be this one is a little bit of a difficult read okay but it's going to it's going to stretch you but you're going to learn a lot and you're going to come away thinking there is so much reason to believe in god there's so much of it it's called which if you're a truth seeker that should be the goal of any book you buy any book you buy, you should be like, yeah, I'm going to come away so much more entrenched in the position that I was already in before I read this book. That's what truth is, guys. You know, it's, it, this is what I mean about just the lack of self-awareness about the things that he says and how even to me, it just feels manipulative. Like when he's saying these things, like I care about truth, I care about having a loving discourse more than establishing my conclusion. It just seems in tension with like this dumb shit that he goes on to say. How reason can lead to God how Reason Can Lead to God. It's by a Christian philosopher by the name of Josh Rasmussen. He also has another book called The Bridge of Reason, which is an even... Honestly, I did not find this book that good. Um, I mean, I think Cameron feels compelled to say this out of 
Josh being on the board for capturing Christianity and how much Josh has um, aided Cameron in certain ways with like scripts and doing work for him and things like that. But the book itself, honestly, it just, it, I don't think it even moved the needle for me. I'm not saying it isn't like a good book, that it's not well written or well considered or anything like that. It, But it it's not like this crazy, like world defeating thing that it can be presented as like more entry level book that you can pick up. So just look at, look into his work. He has a YouTube channel as well called worldview design. He's one of uh, he's actually on the board of capturing Christianity. He's super, super good. I highly recommend checking him out. So that's what I'd recommend. Thank you. Rexon Hunter of Trinity radio, uh, subscribe <laughs> to his channel. Yeah. So, um, uh, we both are interested in seeing people come to Christ and the conversation like you described with a scientist just a little while ago, yeah. um, that, that could be really stressful for someone. And you did say something about, you know, knowing things and having that sort of mm -hmm. level of understanding makes that less fearful. But what about for people to deal with anxiety and these kind of things? Um, surely no one with anxiety could ever have a conversation. Like Wait, this is the voice of Braxton Hunter I can hear, is it? Like that? Yeah, so that's that's where you can go. He was set, he, that was a softball. He was setting him up, I think, because you see that little smile. Of I mean, that sort of mm -hmm. level of understanding makes that less fearful. But what about for people to deal with anxiety and these kind of things? Um, surely no one with anxiety could ever have a conversation like that. See that smile that right there, that one that Cameron just gave to Braxton? Because that smile was an acknowledgement, okay, because he and Braxton have talked about mental health issues from a Christian perspective. Um, and it, so this is like another pokemon card now in the deck because obviously mental health is like something popular to talk about and you can get like street cred off the kids if you talk about mental health in a certain kind of way not if you talk about it in the kind of way that i'll talk about it where i'll just be like fucking unhinged and criticize people but in the way where i will have a mental health episode on stream but in the kind of way where um you know you you sort of get people to feel sorry for you and um you know you make mental health issues into a kind of badge of pride or something if so you can get popular doing that. And then Cameron's kind of got this like Christian marketing spin. Now, this is another avenue. So, so Braxton's asking this question about mental health, like throwing him a big softball. So Cameron can now like make himself look good. And this is like, that's what that smile is. It's the mutual, like, I, you know, you pat my back and I pat yours sort of. Yeah, so that's that's where you can go uh, and, and ask questions, like kind of like what I was doing. So when you're up against this, I'm getting this from Tactics. I'm going to mention that book probably 10 more times throughout the night. But in the book, he mentions that when you're up against like a superior force, instead of trying to go on the offense, like that doesn't make a whole lot, like, so a whole lot of sense. You can actually just kind of like lay on your back, belly up, and let them like take all the shots at you that you want, that, that they want. And that can actually be a way of just Because you've got the Holy Spirit on your side. You've got the God of the universe on your side. Um, and so you can just lie on your back, belly up. Arming them because they're no longer thinking that like, oh, I'm battling this person. You're actually wanting to learn from them. And so they can kind of let their guard down. You can actually grow as well. So you can ask questions about their objections. And if they have a good objection to Christianity, you can take that home with you. You can think more about it and then come away with a greater knowledge of Christianity. But if you deal with anxiety, you don't have to like, you know, come prepared with all of these things to say, you can just ask questions to somebody. And that's a really good way of not, yeah, of avoiding this, this kind of situation where you're super scared or fearful, uh, especially if you haven't done the, the requisite work of looking into apologetics, but that's another thing that you've just got to do. Okay, another caller. Welcome, Jared. What do you disagree with me about? Um, I guess I would just wanted to see kind of, because I've heard you criticize Cameron a lot, and I just wondered kind of where that comes from. Um, I was sort of reflecting on this about 10 minutes ago, and I, I don't know, like, I I don't know if it's, I some of the suggestions I made were that maybe it's his sort of like, mm -hmm. the, the kind of millennial... Um, thing that he's trying to do where he's like look i'm a cool young kid and i wear all these trendy things like that sort of rubs me up the wrong way his yeah. marketing irritates me um i think his lack of self-awareness with some of the things that he says and does the the salesmanship of it i also mm -hmm. feel like um e even though I'm, I'm not a christian i definitely still have like a, a respect for the holy and things like that right and i feel like what Cameron is doing is um, like desecrating the holy in a way um, mm, by making it about this like Americanized corporate yeah, type yeah. BS rather than it being like this reverent religious thing. So or just a mixture of all this stuff just annoys me about Cameron. And mm -hmm. uh, or maybe I'm just deeply, you know, attracted to him and I'm repressing it. And the way that that comes out is, uh, I, I don't know. 
No, no, no. Sorry. I, I did hear that bit. I, I phrased my question in a very, very uh, a poor way or general way, I guess. <laughs> I'm, I'm okay. sort of more wondering like where the, because um, I, I feel like you kind of attribute to him a lot of uh, sort of um, like cynical motives. And I was just wondering kind of like where that, oh. where that comes from, you know, like what, what sort of, oh, go ahead. Uh, so a few, some of them, so, some of the evidence for me, at least against um, him being a good faith actor comes from like the way he marketed his friend's death once. That was really weird mm -hmm. where um, I, I don't know if, if you know about this, but just to, to kind of tell the story, at least tell my side of the story, you know, obviously yeah. there's more than one side, but um, so, so his friend who was like a big donator to his channel um, a guy called Russ, I've forgotten his his surname, but Russ passed away of a heart attack and was contributing maybe like a third of Cameron's monthly patrons or something. Jeez. And so, and so when Russ died, Cameron put a picture up of Russ with his family, um, saying, "Oh, a big a big patron um, has passed away." So it's time. So it's time for you to increase your spending. You know, Russ was a big supporter of capturing Christianity, and um, uh, and it's tax deductible and stuff. And it was just like really poor taste. And it was like, it, you know, it was a day after the guy had died. It wasn't like here's where you can go and donate to the family. It wasn't like just con if it no. was just condolences to the family or something like that'd be respectful. But it was the way that the the picture of the guy with his family was being used to manipulate people to donate more to capturing Christianity. And that was just really um, slimy to me. It may, it, or I mean, even if it's not being done consciously, like how can I manipulate people? It showed me that, it, you know, and I don't think it is being done like that, but it showed me that where Cameron's sense of concern for people and things that is kind of self, you know, the, the thing that comes first for him is this self-interest about his salary and being able to do YouTube and things like that mm. and not like concern for other people and like, you know, a, a family who's just lost a father, for example. And that just pisses me off. And I see that quite consistently in his engagement. Like th there were things that he said about me and James and his interactions with me um, when I deconverted and, uh, and, and oh, that sort of that. stuff just annoys me about him. Yeah. I didn't realize he'd like publicly acknowledged either of you. <laughs> Ever. Yeah, well, well, he tries not to publicly, and and this is another of the things, the two faceness of it, um, because his his public persona is very separate from his private persona, and so when you see the way that he talks about things in um, like private Facebook groups and things, it comes, it, it's very transparent that he isn't like very intelligent, doesn't have a lot of good things to say about these things, and can some and, and has like you know quite a, a mean streak in him, but his public persona as it comes across through the public feed and his YouTube channel is so filtered that none of that comes across. And so people don't get a chance to make an accurate assessment of him as well. And I don't like it when people do that. You know, like I, I prefer when people, when people, obviously it's never going to be perfect, but when people's public profile matches up to their private profile as much as it can, like something about that, I'm like, that's a good thing. Um, mm, yeah, sure. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's good to, I guess, hear this stuff because I, I guess just to kind of articulate my, my perspective on it a little bit um i, I don't know if you yeah feel free like, yeah. um like remember me or recognize me i've just sort of been here and there on the channel but i um i'm you know not a christian um and uh i still i don't know it, i i i'm sort of trying to figure out like i guess if it's just me being naive or what but i um I just kind of see Cameron as sort of like uh, goofy, you know. I don't know. <laughs> well, like I mean, that could be right. You know, it could be that I've just got these personal biases because of whatever reasons, right? Sure. You, well, and yeah, I mean, don't we all? But I guess it's like to me, he um, and maybe this is you know me like infantilizing him to a certain degree, you know, where I just kind of like don't take him very seriously, and I'm just kind of like, oh, whatever, you know. He's just, but um, I think he he genuinely strikes me as someone. I'm not saying this to like insult him or anything but he just strikes me as someone who has a lot of um insecurities behind the scene i think it kind of comes through a lot in his narrative you know when he shares like his story about his brother and things like that i think he kind of has again this is me just like psychologizing but it, it sort of yeah. comes across to me as someone who kind of has a bit of maybe a chip on his shoulder you know had kind of had this sort of uh traumatic moment where he was sort of kind of faced with his lack of intellectual justification for his worldview and has kind of since been trying to like recover that um, 
sense of self or something like that. And so to me, I guess I see him as someone, I don't know, I, I guess I'm I'm quicker to attribute kind of like genuine motives to him. I do think he's very yeah. flawed. And I, I think I can point to examples of him, you know, where he's kind of being dishonest um, and things that do kind of make me wince a little bit. But I guess I'm quicker to sort of chalk that up to him kind of making mistakes because I, I see him as sort of like a flawed person. But I do also think he, it seems like he's making efforts to really kind of try as well. Um, I think you hear a lot of sort of Josh Rasmussen's language rubbing off on him more and more lately. And um, yeah, I don't know. I, I guess I'm not entirely sure where I was going with that, but I guess I, I just sort of have like a different picture of him and kind of see him as someone who's trying, but is kind of tripping at the same time, you know? <laughs> No, I, th I think I, I don't disagree with anything you've said there, really. You know, like, I, th I, I think that what you've said is right. And maybe people who haven't been, like, who aren't as personally, like, pissed off with him as me should view him, you know, the way that you view him. Whereas for me, I'm like, um, you know, I have this, like, personal animosity towards him. And maybe that clouds my sure. judgment. Um, well, I, I do think that's yeah. valid. You know, I think that, you know, like that point you made about his, his friend's passing, that's obviously... Um, pretty egregious <laughs> you know i don't think there's kind of another way to sort of glance but, but i still think it, it, even in terms of what you're saying like i think that could just drop out of that can be viewed as dropping out of the kind of like goofiness and insecurities and things mm -hmm. where you know this guy is just genuinely not like a great thinker when it comes to these things so he's not being sensitive because his first thought is just like oh shit like i've lost all my money and, sure. uh, and it, it doesn't actually have the cognitive tools to like reread that and be like oh yeah that is insensitive you just, like oh just, sure just isn't a consideration you know like in in the same yeah. way yeah yeah but I, I guess to your point you know it's and th this is something i kind of struggle with continuously because i tend to be very sort of um i don't know what's what's the opposite of cynical i guess like charitable um <laughs> yeah to, to like naive i guess naive um in, in charitable fine as well like i i, I think, think that's, that's the positive way of describing it i think i'm trying to go more negative because yeah. i don't think it's always a good thing but um yeah, I think I think I can be sort of naive in, in ascribing motives to people sometimes. And um, I think it's also valid to sort of consider, um, you know, what what I might be missing, because obviously you kind of have a somewhat more direct line with him and kind of might be privy to more things behind the scene versus me who just kind of sees his thumbnail scroll by my feet every now and then, you know, because it, it does kind of get to a point where it's like, OK, well, how many things like how often does someone have to kind of like stumble like that before you start kind of reading between the lines? Um, and yeah, I don't know that that's something I've been kind of trying to consider as well, but. No, that's cool. I, I appreciate you coming on and, you know, like sharing a slightly different perspective on that. So thanks for that. Yeah, I don't know. I'll, I'll have to think about it more. But anyway, that's, that was kind of the gist of what I wanted to chat about. Just see if cool. you had any more <laughs> info that I wasn't aware of. Yeah, not, not all too much more, but I, I mean, I do have, I, I did do an episode on that thing, that camera, I mean, not to, to plug my own channel, but, um, I think it's called immoral fundraising and capturing Christianity or something like that. And mm. I specifically looking at like that post and a few of, and, and some of the other things that Cameron did that frustrated me at the time. But, um, and also another one would be the bad apologetics episode with Stephen Woodford. Oh, um, sure. The, the, Sorry, the, the one you did with him or the one uh, where not, you were yeah. reviewing their debate? Yeah. The one where we were reviewing their debate. I yeah. Spoke, so I, yeah. I do think that one was, um, yeah, there was some, just, I think, kind of egregious stuff that uh, Cameron was pulling yeah. out the debate a little bit. And I think it, I, I think that side of Cameron's personality came out. And and now I think there's something to what you're saying, though, where some of that stuff probably comes more from, like, this place of insecurity and, like, you know, just unconscious trying to protect his ego rather mm -hmm. than it comes from this place of just being, like, a nasty, mean person or something. But um, so maybe right. it should be viewed in, like, a more charitable light. But well, I just get really frustrated by it. No, I I know what you mean. And I, I do think, like, again, that's another one of those instances where I think that um, Cameron, to me, as an outsider, just kind of psychologizing, you know, not knowing anything, it, it looked to me like he was very kind of, like, insecure and in trying to find his footing throughout that debate um, to the point, like, that I think kind of one of the quintessential examples is towards the end of the debate when uh, Stephen brings up the uh, unsatisfiable pair diagnosis and in Cameron's response video, he kind of um, plays it off as though he was like, 
oh, like, I'm so glad that Stevens brought this up. It's like, you know, this is a really good objection. I'm glad we're finally getting there. Oh, that when, one, when, that one that I've been thinking about. Exactly. You know, and I, just, yeah. I, I really just did not get the impression that Cameron was even aware of it before Stephen brought it up. But in his response, he kind of makes it seem like, oh, I was just sitting back and waiting for you to, to bring it up, you know, yeah. that, that yeah. kind of rubbed me the wrong way. And that, that was an instance where I was like, hmm, like, that's kind of a weird way to I don't know, phrase that in a response where I think it's pretty evident, you know, like literally in that. Yeah, it's like series, a power like a, move type thing. Yeah. And like a, even a couple of videos back, he he wasn't even aware that anyone could object to like the Grim Reaper paradox, you know? So I just find it kind of yeah. hard to believe that he's been sitting there in the back, like, oh, wait till Steven brings up, you know, the uh, UBB or uh, I forget the abbreviation, unsatisfiable paradiagnosis. Um, and then I'll really get him, you know, <laughs> I, I just didn't get that impression. And so that was kind of one of those moments where I was like, huh, that seems kind of, that, that seems pretty like dishonest to, I don't know, try to play it up like you were just, you know, he fell right into my trap or something. Um, yeah. When I think Stephen clearly kind of raised like a really strong objection uh, in that video. And I don't know, I think if he were kind of acting more in line with his, like the philosophy that he seems yeah, to kind say, of be espousing. I hadn't heard of this before. Um, yeah, I think he... should be, this is like a real objection. I had mm -hmm. to think about it for the first time. Here's some avenues I came up with. What yeah, think exactly. I think that could have been a great moment for him to be like, oh, like this, this is like a great instance, I think, of the power of this format, you know, like I wasn't even aware of this. And Stephen phrased it, and I really had to like go and, you know, we're learning from each other and that kind of thing. And um, I think that that could have really been, yeah, like a big um, instance where he could have like pushed through this thesis that I think he seems to be kind of working up more towards with this channel lately of like kind of trying to bridge this gap and sort of, you know, uh, the charitability, uh, cha charitability, oh my God, <laughs> charitability, whatever. <laughs> um, you know, just trying to be more charitable in discussions and, um, you know, pretend to like, you might want to call it love bombing, but, you know, sort of being like the really kind of uh, positive and trying to be loving towards your interlocutors and things like that. So, um, yeah, I don't know. That, that was, I think, a, one of those moments where it was pretty unambiguously like a slip up. But I do think there are also times where like, it's it's tough to read kind of the motive from social media. Um, yeah. Like I think sometimes his posts are kind of like tongue in cheek, and he's kind of like you know aware of what he was doing. Even in just now, the exchange between Braxton and him uh, with Braxton's question, I don't think that was really supposed to be like veiled or anything. You know, like they were kind of winking at each other, like oh, like I'm going to set you up, you know, for this or anything like that. I think Braxton was pretty obviously like with his you know, his comment about like, surely no one with anxiety could like, I, I thought yeah, that was yeah. kind of him being like sarcastic, you know? Um, yeah. And sometimes his posts are funny. I don't know, even if they're kind of <laughs> uh, derisive towards my position. Yeah. Well, I, th I think that's a healthier way of viewing, viewing it um, than my one where I just get pissed off at him. But Well, it's easy uh, for me, right? Like this is, I'm not in this world as much. So yeah, maybe, I maybe that's kind of part of it. Yeah, maybe I, I think I should probably view it a bit more like you. Um, but Cameron just gets under my skin. For some, for some <laughs> I'm not immune to it either. So. Um, anyway, okay, that, well, that was kind of nice. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for sharing and uh, coming on. I appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, of course. Cheers. Thanks. Okay, um, let's play the last bit then of this. Like you've got to look into and read books and watch these guys that, that were recommended and do that hard work. And that is also going to help reduce some of that fear and anxiety as well. So when, you, when you're talking about online discussions, getting heated or dis in disagreements about everything, a, a lot of people outside of it's Pritchett apologetics and church circles uh, that are really just lay people in general have a lot of these conversations, whether it's about politics online or it's about Marvel movies or their favorite sports teams. And they, I mean, heated discussions about everything is, seems to happen. And I think that those are good tactics for that. But what are ways to think about turning those conversations that we're having with people? Because obviously, if you're in a debate, you still have a similar interest in whatever you're fussing about. How do we steer those conversations to more? gospel center conversations to where we can change the subject from these conversations and steer them more to something that, you know, trying to share the gospel. So I, I guess my, my thought on that is that I would prefer to let those types of conversations happen organically. And I'm just going to relate it back to conversations with my brother when I first, like, cause that, this isn't the whole story, but this first conversation that I had with my brother, that's like not the whole story of our relationship and how this has developed. But at the very beginning, all I wanted to do was give him all of these arguments. So like just spew it out at him every chance I had. And what I noticed was that that was not productive, like at all with him. And so what I, what I decided... So what I did is I went away and I made a video, 150 plus arguments for the existence of God. <laughs> One day I was just like, I'm going to completely change this, what, what I'm doing. And that's what actually led to this first point. And I created a YouTube channel, which is explicitly about presenting and defending arguments so that they can be spewed out for the existence of God. Here about loving, uh, just loving people. And even the things he was saying about 
books, right? And like reading these books. So you have more plausible things to say in defense of premises of arguments. Cool. When I started to actually love him and that was my goal, instead of like trying to have some ulterior motive to like change the conversation into a discussion about apologetics or the gospel or anything, my focus changed from doing that, from having some ulterior motive about what I wanted to talk about. Instead, I just loved on him. And when I started to do that, that's when conversations with him really started to like go positive. And is when he says loved on him, is that like an Americanism, like an American turn of phrase? Because it, it sounds a bit odd to me. Since then, like he has organically brought up topics and I'm just like, okay, let's talk about it now. Like you're interested in talking about this. We can talk about it now. This is like a good time. Instead of me trying to like bring it up and. You know what? I don't know the answer to that. What a perfect example. If I don't know, very good, very good. There you go. No, I, I, yeah, I, I really, I mean, the only thing that kind of comes to mind is just setting the example and I guess letting people learn about that organically. I'm a, I'm a real big fan of organic stuff. So in conversations, not necessarily like. <laughs> Thank you for clarifying. Uh, Kirk. So if you had to strip it down to the most basic fundamental level, what do you think is the Number one reason why people choose not to believe. See, that kind of stuff, I usually choose not to believe. It just seems like, for most people, it, it's not like a... It seems like choice is just the wrong word to use. It seems like people just sort of evaluate things, right? And maybe they evaluate them for reasons. Maybe they don't evaluate them for reasons. And there's other things at play, but people just sort of evaluate them. It's not like... You know, I'm not just choosing to not believe Christianity is true at the minute. I'm genuinely not. It, I, I'm genuinely not just choosing. It just kind of happened, right? It just kind of fell that way. They no longer believe. No, I think I think there's a sense in which one could say I have like a responsibility for the things I believe, insofar as like I could be a lazy mofo, and like just not read some books, like. So, so people who talk about so people who continually the thing that really annoys me people who continually present just so um, stories from natural selection and don't put in the work to like just read you know some basic stuff about evolution and about like the problems with theorizing in that way and the tendency the the proclivity to produce like just so stories which are consistent with any outcome and have no empirical content and so forth. Right, I I think those people are responsible in the sense that they they're quite ha happy to bandy about a term that they they've not taken on the kind of epistemic virtue of of reading about that thing, and so they actually have something useful to say about it. Um, so in that sense, they're responsible. Could the same criticism be made by a Christian towards me? Maybe you know, maybe they could say, "Well, the real reason, Nathan, that you disagree is just because you've not had the." But I think it would be difficult to levy that against me, considering, like, you know, I've actually gone and done a master's degree in philosophy, and for example, you know, so far far on my philosophy of religion component of the course, I'm averaging like ninety percent on essays. So, I mean, that's pretty decent, and that's more than Cameron's done. I mean, he didn't go and get a formal education in this, so. I mean, so I may, so I guess I could respond by saying, well, that's just not accurate. Like, clearly, I have done the work, and I've read a, a bunch, and it still just happens to be the case that I just assess it another way. But it's just weird phrasing, like this phrase, phraseology of choosing to not believe. It's like, yeah, I, I've decided this morning I'm going to figure out how to not believe in Christianity. Like, no one does that, I don't think. He straight away. So the, the question is, why do people not believe in God? And that gets into the realm of psychology. And I do my best to like, because I'm not a psychologist. And that I'm a psychologizer. You're you're listening to the best psychologizer on YouTube. Can kind of sound like a cop out, but I try not to pontificate or speculate about people's motives because that can just get into really tricky stuff really quickly. So instead, what I focus on are what are the arguments? Is there good reason to think that God exists? Is there good reason to think that God doesn't exist? So that's what I'm talking about on Sundays. You know, the best argument against the existence of God. So he just he just said before, remember that just trading arguments is, is worthless. But now he's saying that his modus operandi is to just trade arguments, right? And 
It's like there's an inconsistency here. That, that's the type of stuff that I focus on is what are the, what are the arguments for and against? And so, sorry, I'm, I'm not really going to give you a great answer to that, but. <laughs> Over here. Uh, to, oh, wow. uh, what you were saying earlier, you were talking about um, uh, your three reasons. It got me thinking about um, a problem with, and that's not Christianity itself, but some Christians. A Can you talk more to the mic? It's kind of difficult to hear. Sorry. An undisciplined arrogance some, some Christians seem to have uh, when preaching. It seems like because you're born to Christianity and you grow up as a Christian, that you are in, I don't want to say it rudely, but a echo chamber of sorts. So you're uh, not exposed to a whole host of other theologies, philosophies, politics, religions, etc. So you are in a... Uh, so when you're into a debate, um, and you, this is related to what you were talking about earlier with yourself and your brother, um, yeah, what Dad said, knowledge. Um, there's this arrogance in that since you're a Christian, you believe in your truth, and there's the undisciplined in that you don't listen to the other people. Um, so how do you avoid this undisciplined arrogance? How do you avoid it the best way possible? Can you, sorry, can you rephrase the question? It's kind of, it's, it's kind of difficult to avoid. Yeah. <laughs> how do you avoid the trap of so undisciplined arrogance? Yeah, we don't. We, we I think what he's asking is we think that our belief is true. Yeah, and we typically are told that we believe that because this is what we grew up in mm -hmm. and we don't get a lot of exposure to other worldviews. Yeah, so what would you recommend for, for, for dealing with that situation as far as we can talk about knowledge, we can talk about apologetics books, but apologetics books are basically just giving our side of the mm -hmm. thing. And so, how, yeah. to how to get more exposure to views that, you're, that you don't yourself hold. I think, I think what you could do is just befriend somebody who, who doesn't hold that belief. Um, I mean, that, that's one way that you can go about it. You can also, I mean, YouTube is a really fantastic resource. If you're not on YouTube or if you don't watch a whole lot of YouTube, there are atheist YouTubers who are creating videos on atheism and why they believe what they believe. So you can actually go on and find out a lot of that stuff just by going on YouTube and listening from themselves what they have to say about their reasons for disbelieving. So, but I would say probably one of the best ways is to, I mean, and it's not always possible. You can't always go and find some like person who you work with or, you know, family member or friend. I'm fortunate that, that I do have someone that I can talk to about these things and get a different perspective. But if you don't have that, you can always go on YouTube. That, that would be probably like my number one recommendation is to, to just go on YouTube and look at some videos on people who, who do have to say things about that. Yeah. Anybody else? Yes. I really don't. For young kids, gotcha. for young kids, like what, he's 14, but he's super, super smart. Um, what would you suggest a video or a YouTube channel for younger kids, maybe? For my channel. <laughs> younger kids? I mean, younger, but super smart. Does that make sense? Yeah. Like, he wants to hear someone his age, but it has to be intelligent. Uh -huh. um, when he wanted to play for Notre Dame, he learned all about Catholicism, but I want him to, you know what I mean? Does that yeah. Make sense? Capturing Christianity might be the channel for him. <laughs> it might be. It might be. Because, so here's, here's what sort of separates Capturing Christianity from a lot of these other channels, is that we get deeper into the issues. We get real, real deep sometimes. Like, it depends on the issue. Yeah, so we, we will provide 15 premises for a premise that's disputed, and for each of those premises that are disputed, we will provide a further 15 premises. But that's that's one of the things that was sort of missing. There's a lot of apologetics ministries that are kind of s s not surface level in a bad way, but they're surface level, right? They're giving an introduction to some topic as opposed to really digging deep and going to the to the edges of whatever argument or whatever else. And so capturing Christianity might be the way, might be the place for you to send him. But it really also depends on what his interests are. So if he is interested in arguments for and against the existence of God, I would definitely recommend that book that I recommended earlier from Josh Rasmussen, How Reason Can Lead to God, because that one does get deep, but it's also presented in a very accessible way. So and I think... If, if you're saying like he's intelligent, he's smart, then I would definitely recommend try, trying that book out. And he's going to be in therapy at 40 when <laughs> he realizes he's not the smartest kid in the world. But his uh, mom told him, who, who do you want me to make a mod V? Who do you want me to make a mod? Let me see. Who have we got in the chat? Who have we got? And this will be my last act as despot before I go to bed. So my last act as fiat of the digital gnosis youtube channel okay where are we who's it gonna be who's it gonna be you see borderline i would make jamie russell a mod but it's like a you know it's like a 50 50 chance whether jamie's going to be completely unhinged um when he comes in Oh, Svez can be a mod because Svez is a mod in the Discord already. I would make YouTube Punk a mod as well. I suppose YouTube Chink did, Punk did leave Pine Creek for me. I just worry, though, that what YouTube Punk would do is potentially ban me when I share my political hot takes. Yeah, YouTube Punk, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to promote you as well. So there have been two promotions tonight. Um, so there we go.
Nidimus as well. Ooh. Nidimus. Do you want to be a mod Nidimus? I, I tell you what, do, do you want to be a mod Nidimus? You tell me that. And I will make you a mod if you want to be. But if not, you don't have to have that responsibility. Um, oh, yeah, and we've got Jay. Jay's a mod here. Jesus, everyone is a mod now in the chat. I'm going to have to take some away. Yeah, it looks like Nidimus doesn't want to be a mod, so... So that, thus, I conclude um, promotions for tonight. Okay, last thing then, before we go, time for my shameless marketing. Um, I'm just going to... Oh, where's it gone? Where's it gone? Okay, so, yeah, if you've enjoyed the video, don't forget to like and subscribe for more. And also, you can become a patron... Um, you know, three pounds a month, it helps support me, especially with inflation now. Um, you know, the more of you, the better. And you can make one of PayPal donations or recurring PayPal donations as well. I'm going to say thanks to my patrons. Um, so Mike Apple, Victor Luderum, Stacy, Scotty, uh, Margaret DeVelden, Kieran CJ, Dirth Funk, Laura Hagen, Michael Hagee, Nick Golden, John Camacho, uh, Yana Ad... Idamir, that's uh that's Fingy's wife, isn't it? Um Fingy Idamir, the um apostate prophet. Uh Kali is a patron. Rebecca, bread of from Bread of Life, Mitch Mazzaroli, thank you, Eric Edgerton, James Fodor of the James Fodor YouTube channel and the Science of Everything podcast. Thank you, James. Um Nathaniel Briner, Gary McCurchy, and Elor Chess. Um, are all patrons. So thank you guys. I really appreciate it. Um, and I did make a post recently about you guys who are mods, if, uh, uh, sorry, you guys who are patrons, if you actually want more, you know, if you, if you want more from patron, because I don't really know what you guys want as special patron privileges or anything like that. And I'm happy to, you know, try and accommodate within reason. So let me know and respond to that if you agree okay final final comment then i'm gonna say i think jerry fodor is an asshole um <laughs> just do i agree with everything jerry fodor believes i didn't i i tend to not agree with everything jerry fodor agrees so i think he might have some interesting points about evolution okay thank you everyone I hope you enjoyed this stream.